Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of The Radical Imagination. I'm Michael Pelius, the co-host for today, with my colleague and other co-host, Peter Bratzis, to my left here. And today we have a very interesting uh, discussion to unfold with uh, two very active academic union um, um, members. Um, I'm going to introduce to my uh, to the left of Peter Jessica Rosenberg, who is the president of the Long Island University Faculty um, Federation and also a professor of social work at LIU Brooklyn, and Sharon Persinger, who is the treasurer of the Professional Staff Congress and also a professor of mathematics and community, uh, excuse me, and, and uh, computer science at Bronx Community College. And both of us, them are here today to join us in a discussion on the role, function, and future of academic union and academic unionism. And I'm going to begin today with uh, just a very general introduction that over the past 30, 35 years, we have witnessed the increasing corporatization and almost full-fledged now corporatization of our educational institutions. And we would like today to frame around this increasing corporatization or almost the completed project of something that, in my opinion, begins in the late 70s and early 80s, particularly during the Reagan administration, and now being continued by Obama's race to the uh, top, they call it. We call it race to the bottom in some of our uh, <laughs> some of our unions. Um, we're going to talk about this in in terms of, of various symptoms, and these symptoms. The first symptom I would like to address um, will be uh, both with with Jessica and Sharon is the increasing dependency upon part-time or what is called adjunct labor or the adjunct adjunctification of the university. Um, and uh, basically the title of today's talk is really exploiting the overeducated and the underemployed. And I think this would not only reach to part-time faculty, but also to full-time faculty as a general topic. Mm -hmm. But let's begin with uh, Jessica and then Sharon with this, uh, this reliance now on adjunct labor as well as, you know, um, what this means maybe to the future of the academy and what role do unions now play in giving a fair deal to these part-time people who are piecing together basically a, a barely paycheck to paycheck uh, ways of subsistence. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, when I joined the faculty at LIU, which was in 2003, um, and in the, at that time I was new to academia, one of the things that I began to learn and realize, and I think the thing that it has really struck me the most about um, academia is the exploitation of adjunct faculty. And it is so pervasive, it is so deep, it is so wrong on so many multiple levels. Um, and obviously it's not LIU only. I mean, we now know that throughout the, throughout the country, it's, a, you know, 60% some people say could be higher. Um, court, you know, the amount, uh, percentage of faculty that is adjunct faculty, but the fact of the matter is, is that universities would go out of business tomorrow, you know, if they didn't have adjunct faculty and that it's, the level of exploitation is huge. I also want to say that it is extremely damaging to student learning, you know, because we have so many talented adjunct faculty, part-time faculty that are just shut out of the box. They're not allowed to participate in meetings, in curriculum, in decision making, in faculty um, forums, in so many ways. So this really damages our students. It damages learning, and it's it's an exploitation that cannot continue. So I would just say at the LIUFF, which by the way, Michael Paleus is the been involved with, with our union longer than anybody present in our executive committee, but the LAUFF is very, very committed to finding some justice and some fairness for our adjunct faculty. You know, for the adjuncts, for ourselves, it enriches us. I think, um, I think that one of the commonalities that, you know, LAUFF and, and PSC CUNY share um, is that we represent both full-time and part-time faculty. You represent yes, part-time faculty as well. So 
we need to find ways to understand that we are in you know the boat together that we're not you know some i think it's it, it the wedge between full time and part time faculty can be easily exploited by administrators and others to the disadvantage of the whole of our so you know we're looking always for ways to bridge the gap to build bridges between um our full time and part time faculty which i feel that we're being very successful at doing so uh, but that's that's you know that's our commitment, and we're going to stand by our, that commitment to get. Okay, yeah. Sharon, you have uh, what eight thousand so adjuncts I, I in the I wish I could PSA, say that this, yeah. the yeah. situation at CUNY was significantly different, but right. it's not. Okay, um, we have more adjuncts than full-time faculty, and they teach at least half of the courses, probably about half the courses. It will mm -hmm. vary a little bit depending upon a particular college and a particular mm -hmm. department. Um, the PSC decided at its inception that it wanted to be a union of both full-time faculty and staff um, and part-timers. We also have part-time staff in some titles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so melding those two groups into one union, there's sometimes some, some struggles there, but um, I think it's better for all of us if we sort of do the struggles inside than, than to allow um, management to separate us. Um, Agreed. Yeah, I think we've had some successes at, at uh, winning advances for our part-timers. Uh, a big struggle to institutionalize funding for part-time, for, for health insurance for part-timers who meet certain criteria. That mm -hmm. was something that we accomplished through the end of the summer. Um, current, in our current bargaining, we've had a demand for um, a longer term appointment with some more job security than mm -hmm. is current rather than um, currently a, a, an adjunct could be appointed semester to semester and then after um, meeting some longevity conditions would be appointed a year at a time. Um, but we've been bargaining for something that has some more security than that. I have to say, by the way, I, the, the term adjunct you know, it's something that's supplemental at the side kind right. of thing, and it was right. developed a long time ago right. when, right. when the part-time teacher was maybe an accountant who taught one accounting mm -hmm. course, right. but the university was still staffed mostly by uh, people who had full-time jobs with some possibility of job security. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not an appropriate right. term any longer. It's, yes. it's, we, we agree. Yeah. And also um, on that note, I think even the term part-time is to me, it, it, it's, um, it doesn't make sense because many of the so-called part-time faculty are actually teaching full-time. In fact, many of them teach more than the full-time faculty. So, you know, I think that the issue really when we think about it is contingency and contingent labor and the precariat. But in, and also, this is clearly not just an issue for higher education because, you know, contingent labor is a workforce category, right. you know, is becoming f much right. more dominant across right. the board as people no longer have any more, you know, full-time jobs with benefits and, you know, and so on and so forth. But, you know, the, the it is true that, you know, that, that words matter, of course. So I, I do think that, you know, that it is um, a problematic term. And part-time doesn't really capture it, but... Um, that being said, um, we have uh, gotten a health care fund for our contingent labor, part-time adjunct faculty that um, we're going to be building on that. We hope to be um, because, you know, obviously that was an important win mm -hmm. um, prior to my becoming president of the LAUFF, mm -hmm. but something that I'm proud to have been a mm -hmm. trustee of for so many years now. Mm -hmm. I think you both raise a very a good point that teaching is no longer, quote, the noble profession or the purview of a professional class right. of people who do it on a, quote, part-time basis just to supplement income. It is now really an issue of labor, yeah. and we're really dealing with no longer just people who, who have tried to get into the profession, that we have a tremendous amount of overqualified, you know, over-educated people mm. in a mix making 
making basically what you could consider almost a minimum wage for yeah. people with their kind of credentials, et cetera. And this is a major issue uh, going forward in the future. I think of everything from class learn, classroom rate, uh, learning to you know the general yeah. economy itself. And it's not only yeah. specific to educational institutions, as you pointed out, but this is one area that right. now that the professor now no, no longer sees, especially the so-called contingent professor, oh. no longer sees teaching as a quote you know, noble, you know, calling or as a, a vocation, but much more as a labor intensive endeavor and as a laborer. You know, yeah. you're really talking about academic labor now. Right. And this we'll is teach something for food. we'd really, yes, we'll teach for food. But, um, the name is, of the book, by yeah, the way. Yeah, that yes, is a great right. book, yes. which. Yes, the, right. But, yeah. Um, yeah, it's completely unacceptable. Right. It was really, yeah. actually, I'm going to say, shocking to me in, when I, when I, it, the extent of, I would say, the exploitation, the disrespect, the uh, conditions that our faculty, our contingent faculty, you know, struggle with. At my university and across the country, I, you know, I'm a member of a lot of adjunct blogs and, you know, read a lot about the um, the experience, but it is it is it is unacceptable that uh, this will continue. I, I believe that it will not continue anyway. I mean, these days are going to end with you know this level of exploitation cannot continue because you can't have a system where you know the majority of the workforce is is doesn't share you know that the minority privileged component of the workforce is dominated and taking, you know, the lion's share of the resources that it cannot continue. And it will not continue, in well, my opinion. But, uh, part of the problem is, there is that the banking community and the uh, investment uh, banking, uh, you know, uh, nexus has uh, shown that, uh, you know, this well, is really it what's going on. for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. And this, has been, this has been, you know, <laughs> right. the, the I mean, not, I mean, I understand your, your will and your political will. The unionization, the unionization but, of adjuncts, yeah. it's, you know, <laughs> When, when I first right. actually right. started to talk about this, and you know, mm -hmm. Michael knows, when I first started to talk about this issue in the Senate uh, at LIU, really, I think in those days, I was pretty much one of the few people that was. But now, I think that the discourse has changed. Yeah, I believe so. that the discourse mm -hmm. will change. Yes, yeah. because it cannot continue. You cannot have ninety percent, you know, of a workforce being dominated by, you know. The one percent. So, well, well, that's the, what, the, what reason would there be for the administration, whether at LIU or at CUNY, mm -hmm. to capitulate to the demands? So, something to point out is that, well, a, a legal framework that there's a, a court decisions that limit the ability of full-time faculty at private institutions to unionize. The court decided that since they had a managerial role they right. couldn't unionize. That's the yeshiva decision. Right. Nobody ever says that adjuncts can't unionize. And so we're seeing adjuncts or organizing exactly. everywhere. You know, it's been Across a pretty good year. Public I, institutions, I, the past institutions. couple of years is, the, you know, the new faculty majority and 1199 SCIU is, you know, done a lot of organizing. But the reason that it, what, so why do I think it cannot continue? Or what will, because you can't have a system of oppression persist you know, unchallenged uh, in perpetuity. It just can't, you know, it, because there are too many people who are being left out. There are too many people who are being left out of the equation. There are too many people who, you know, really the truth is, is that the adjunct faculty far outnumber, which, you know, um, you made the point, they far outnumber, you know, so I, I think that the tide will turn, and I think actually the tide is turning, um, and, you know, we probably will not realize all of the, you know, the, the fruit of the struggle in, in, in our work time, but, you know, I don't see this system, I don't see it being able to continue. Well, yeah. maybe it'll get worse. Well, it's possible, yes, it is possible, but you know, a lot of things are going to get worse. Let, let me let me let me phrase the question mm -hmm. this way, right? Because we have not only a CUNY, which right. is I think well over fifty percent of the classes are taught by adjuncts. Columbia, you have seventy percent of the classes being taught by non-tenured or tenure-track right. faculty, and so on down the line. Right. 
Right. I mean, it does, NYU is probably a comparable amount. Yes. Is it possible to undo this kind of tendency within academia of moving towards contingent yeah. part-time labor without changing the way the universities are structured and managed? Right. If the organizational principles remain intact right. and universities are run uh, with an eye towards efficiency, uh, you know, making the most efficient use of resources possible as they understand it right. by professional managers rather than faculty and academics themselves. If this continues, maybe medical benefits can get better or worse or wages can go higher or lower, but is it really feasible to think that this dynamic can be changed? I, I absolutely think it can be changed, and I think it's a struggle. And the reason that I think it can be changed is, listen, there's a very funny movie. You may have seen it. It's called A Day Without a Mexican, and it takes place. It's kind of like a little bit of a sci-fi movie. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's very funny, but it takes place in California. And it's a world that you imagine, you know, one day there's no Mexicans, there's no labor. The point of the movie really is that when there is no labor, okay, there's no labor, things have to change, okay? Now, if there, we decided, you know, there was such a thing as National Adjunct Walkout Day, which I'm gonna say that our, you know, the LIUFF, which was in February, we participated, we did a great event, a National Adjunct Walkout Day, but I will say that, you know, if you imagine a world, imagine a world without the contingent, you know, faculty member, the university will, will not be able to function unless they put all of the administrators will have to go to the classrooms and teach all the classes. Now, we all know that they're not gonna do that. What I'm trying to say is that when you withhold labor, okay, you cannot, you know, it's a struggle of power. It's just that simple. It is a struggle of power. And I believe that, you know, the power is best, you know, the power is there when you realize it. So, you know, I think that it, it is going to change and I think that people cannot put up with a system where the, where the professor in the classroom, you know, basically cannot afford to live, cannot afford to live. And that's not an exaggeration. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I, a, I'm an optimist yeah. on this. I, I think, I mean, what, I think what Peter's leading towards is, is it possible for really any change? I mean, I hear where you're coming from and love the passion and the emotion behind it and the principles involved, but is it possible to really you know, have this kind of change without massive structural change, massive you know, institutional change that goes along with it? It raises the old question of agency and structure, and that unless you change the structure, is there a possibility of any kind of thing? Sharon, yeah, it's, please. It's yeah. a sort of a which yeah. comes first. Yes, I mean, I okay. think the, Fair enough. the yeah. change in mm -hmm. the structure would mm -hmm. have to be forced by a workforce that okay. would refusing yes. to work under those yes. conditions. That's, yes, okay. Right. You know, that's, I agree with you. I do agree with you. And I will also say this, that one of the things that we, one of our operating principles at the LIUFF that I'm very proud of <laughs> is that change comes from below. Okay, so we are building from the ground up, meaning our change is not coming from the senior faculty, the senior professors, this one, that one, the other one, and so on and so forth, no. Our change is going to come up from the bottom and in fact you know the students you mentioned students when we were speaking um, earlier students are a key figure in this whole equation um, but uh, yes the change will come and it will not come and, and the structural change it will come from below and that's exactly what we're doing that's our principle which I think is taking us in a good direction <laughs> It would seem, let me ask you, uh, Sharon, because CUNY is in a particularly difficult moment right now. We are in the middle of contract negotiations. There has not been a, uh, the con last contract expired in 2010. Yep. It has been six years without a contract, seven years without uh, any salary increases uh, for the faculty of CUNY. Uh, do you see this as a moment uh, of optimism, of things getting better? Or do, you, or do you see it as, as, as a difficult moment for CUNY in particular and its, and its future being increasingly in doubt? Well, I think that I can only speak for the Professional Staff Congress, <laughs> not for CUNY yes. as a well. whole. Um, uh, we've got uh, a struggle ahead of us. 
uh, we've been have been struggling. We've been in, in negotiations and in other actions around supporting our contract campaign since the summer through the fall. Um, we've finally received a, a salary offer in November. It was uh, less than inflation, and so would have had we accepted it, it would have meant accepting a salary cut for our members. So we didn't accept it. Um, and we're still struggling. Our complication is that we're a public university. We're funded by the state and to a certain extent by the city. So this means that part of the work that we have to do, I think we'd be irresponsible if we didn't do it, was, is working to see that the university is properly funded. The state has, since the recession in 2008, the state funding, if you measure it at a per student and inflation adjusted kind of basis, it's down 17%, something of that sort. So we're seeing the austerity um, story being continued way beyond a time when you when it started, when, when uh, the bottom fell out of the market and, and uh, government budgets dropped. Um, and we've been struggling against it. Uh, we keep struggling against it. We've got allies uh, within the community with a, a group of community allies, um, people who represent different groups in, in New York City, a lot of people who, whose children go to CUNY. Uh, we've got labor allies. We've got, we're working with students. But I will say it's still a struggle. And, 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 and Jessica previously mentioned two things, withholding of labor and struggles from below. One, pro, one limitation that CUNY has that LIU does not have is that we are bound by uh, the, 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 the Taylor Law in New York State, which uh, does not allow for public sector unions as we are to go on strike. And that, maybe you could say a few words about the difficulties, difficulties this presents to the PSC in terms of its negotiations and its attempts to uh, uh, reach an agreement with, uh, the ma with management. And secondly, if you see any indications of struggle from below, are there student organizations? I mean, one of the watershed moment, moments in the history of CUNY was open admissions, was the, the victory the students uh, achieved in 1969 where open admissions was granted to CUNY by then the Republican governor of, of, of New York State, uh, Nelson Rockefeller. Uh, and so, that was the product of a very intense uh, and violent at times conflict. Do you see anything similar in the horizon that would push? Uh, and push so, I would add to the below, maybe we can incorporate this, the, uh, the adjuncts themselves, are they also, you know, mobilized in some fight. ways? And, yes, the contingents. So the, the second part yeah. first. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, we do have, I know that there are student organizations in the university who are organizing around the current austerity imposition on students, which is higher and higher tuition. Um, the governor has requested in his state budget another round of tuition increases, and there are student groups organizing against that. Um, we, the USS, in fact, the University Senate, the University Student Senate, has taken a position against that. Um, and the PSC is allying with student groups in this um, fight against the shifting of the funding of the university onto the students who. CUNY students don't come from families with lots of money. 50% mm -hmm. uh, of our student body is from families with annual incomes of less than $30,000. Mm -hmm. um, so we are joining with students in that opposition. Um, the other part about uh, the Taylor Law, it's a long story. Um, <laughs> it's a Rockefeller It's a long story. story. It's a <laughs> Rockefeller story. But, but the short version is that um, in the law that recognize the New York State law that recognized the right of public employees to co bargain collectively, there was also a provision that made it illegal for them to strike. Um, I s say to, to people, it, it's, 
it's not accurate to say that we can't strike. It's accurate to say that it's illegal for us to strike, that, that we are breaking the law and we have legal penalties that range from uh, financial penalty, penalties on, on individuals who participate in strikes to heavier penalties on, um, on the union as a whole and, and union officers. Um, the PSC did announce in November that we were going to be conducting a strike authorization vote and organizing among our members in preparation for that. Um, and it's ongoing, the mm -hmm. organization. Uh, honest, um, I think people have this mistaken idea that you can call a strike tomorrow and everybody goes out. Um, and, you know, even in, in unions where striking is legal, if you're going to have us hold a strike, you prepare for it a long mm -hmm. time in advance, and it's a lot of organizing. So I can say we are organizing to hold a vote that would, uh, I need to get the wording right, the, uh, that would authorize, authorize our execu to, yeah, executive council, council to right. call a strike if we felt there was no uh, other way to advance our contract. Negotiations. And you usually need to do that 90 days before you actually yes. go out on strike it's, as well, you know, which a, is another technicality. Yeah, a, um, that, yeah. <laughs> well, but since the striking is illegal right. for us, it's it's it's, we're not, right. you know, we're not course. governed no, no. by any of no, those no, things. No. Um, I'm, I'm aware of that. We, right. We're the ones. We're we're the ones the, we go the 90 that. days yeah. Yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. A strike yeah. Um, yeah. I, mean, I mean, is there a reason, do you think, for CUNY management to make a reasonable offer to us? short of us being able to impose some kind of coercive uh, 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 struggle against them. I mean, why should they offer us anything? Why not just continue well, with the expired contract, the salary stagnant, I mean, the universities yeah, are running? So the, the university has demands in this contract negotiation. And we're, one of the things that the Taylor Law, the um, Tribor Amendment to the Taylor Law does say is that the the conditions of the previous contract remain in force even though it's expired. So yeah. the university wants to get its demands achieved. Um, well, that's one reason. I mean, I, I would, maybe this is just the, the total naive idol, idealist in me, but it, it's the right thing. It's, it's just and fair mm -hmm. to pay your faculty right. what they're, for what their work, worth is work. Yeah to pay them salaries that would allow them to live in the city. I mean, we have full-time workers who can't live right. in the city. Exactly. Right. I mean, I agree with you 100%. And we also have um, full-time faculty who, many of whom cannot afford to live in the city and we're in Brooklyn and they can't afford oh. to live in Brooklyn now. But um, I believe that when you stand on the, you know, the side of justice and fairness, that that will carry you a long way. So. Maybe we see the world through, you know, rose-colored glasses, but when you stand on what's fair, it gives you, you know, the moral high ground here. So you clearly have that, and uh, and um, I, you know, so, like to see so we more have through red glasses, <laughs> so we can. So we have really the moral high ground, and they have so. the cash. That's the right. that's the outcome. They need <laughs> us, okay? They need us to have a university. You, you know, a university needs, first of all, you need faculty, and you also need people who believe in the mission of the university. You need to have, you want a workforce, you want to have a workforce where the workers so-called buy-in, which is really not the best terminology, but you want to have a workforce where people go to work and they say to themselves, I'm committed to what I'm doing, I believe in what I'm doing, you know, and who feel positive about cooperating and doing things and, you know, and see, see those as positives. And you can't have that. You can't have that kind of workforce when people, you know, are so bitter and angry and, and, and can't afford to pay their bills and can't afford to put their own kids through college and, you know, everybody's going into debt. So eventually, university is going to have to settle, okay, because they're going to need to have a, a faculty that are going to want to be in there and, you know, do the best that we can to do our jobs. Well, then, I, I'm not sure that, 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 that they want us to do our jobs. If we understand our jobs, mm -hmm. if we are academics in the traditional sense, right. 
and we are for enlightenment, right. disinterested learning, you know. Yes. And, uh, and in the case of CUNY or an LIU, the students are there for getting credentials for the labor market or from the standpoint of the state and the federal government, they want universities as economic engines and uh, uh, institutions that produce economic values, yes. good for development Training and all the rest. As well. It yeah. would seem yeah. to be mm -hmm. conflictual goals. Because if you're true to, the, to, 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 to academia and the mm -hmm. academic principles, mm -hmm. you don't see the value of education at, in economic terms. Mm -hmm. They do. So mm -hmm. why not go to something like MOOCs online, you know, th that kind of thing as a, for the technical education they want, and right. who cares about people like us who want, who want, who want to, to enlightenment and, 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 and a liberal education. So, so, so just from the, Again, from their, purely their terms, the experience in CUNY Community Colleges, and I teach at a community college, is that online courses are not really effective for our students. Um, we have had some pressures from time to time to increase the number of online courses, but I noticed that the administration stopped increasing the pressure so much, and I think it was because they had realized that it's just not the right model. Yeah, I mean, yeah. 100%. I think, yeah, 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 yeah. The, the so. MOOCs are a big failure, and everybody knows it. You know, a few years ago, everybody was like, oh, MOOCs are taking over, everything is going to be distant, so on and so forth. Everybody knows that it's failed, especially with the kind of students that you're describing, you know, the community college students and undergraduates. It's, you know, it's, nobody learns like that, and everybody, you know, pretty much understands it at this point. And, like, the, the retention rate in the MOOCs and this uh, whole distance learning, it, it's a fad, you know, it has its place. It pretty much failed and fizzled, and it's not going to be the solution. So, uh, I, you know, I'm not too really concerned at this point about being replaced by, you know, a MOOC. And I don't, I don't see that as a, I really was concerned, you know, a couple of years ago, but I think it's so clear that it's been such a massive failure. So we don't think that, um, you know, the late capital at this point is figuring out ways to have a teacherless classroom as they go forward in terms of cost cutting and you know, in a general, in a, in a, in a, in a, as a general tendency. I mean, they may see it as a failure somewhat at certain levels, you know, in community college levels, but at other levels, it's certainly being used, uh, you know, at, uh, as, and especially at the elite schools, you're starting to have more and more of these kind of uh, learning, you know, that are actually being produced by the elite schools too, by the elite school professors that may set up a whole new type of exchange value and, uh, you know, um, you know, new products to be sold to universities where the, the course from Harvard's Department of Economics can be taught at Bronx Community College or LIU Brooklyn or something you know, like the that. Thing I'm is, just, I'm just here's the thing. I'm following colleges, on Peter. Colleges, by you know, the way, we're, colleges we're, yeah, and universities yeah, 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 yeah. are not only about, they, they serve a lot of functions in society, I agree, in terms of credentializing and being part of an apparatus so that, you know, people go on to be so-called productive members of society and so forth. But there's other things that go on as well, you know, especially in that key age group, 18 to 21, 18 to 30. And that's something called social engagement. You know, I promise you that if kids were not in college today, God knows, you know, the, the university has a social protective function. And, you know, it is, it, 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 it cannot so easily be dismantled. So I don't, I don't think that we're seeing the death knell yet. You know, at this point in time, um, we need them. People understand that. Uh, there is a bigger emphasis, I know, on, you know, professionalism and vocational training and so on and so forth. I, I understand that, but there's a social maturation issue. People need to be in school. University and colleges matter. And, uh, and in the end of the day, so does education. So it's it's something though I think we still need to we do need to keep struggling about. You, mm -hmm. you mentioned the the overarching theme of of the corporatization right. of the university, and right. so part of that is that the, the idea of an education has been kind of translated into a private good. 
yes. and mm -hmm. withdrawing mm -hmm. of all the public of, of all public completely. funding, yes. um, mm -hmm. requiring students to pay more and more for their tuition. Yes. And I, I think it's part of our job to continue pushing about the importance of public goods. That these are the things that enable our society broadly to function. It's students are educated not just so that they'll have a better job and be able to support themselves and their families better, but there's even a public good part of that, exactly. which is if they earn more money, they pay more taxes. Mm -hmm. But they're more engaged in society, they're healthier, right. they ha have build better communities. Education serves all of these very broader um, roles of, of making the society kind of stick together and a lot better. And so I think we have to, we have to keep uh, preaching about those things. We I have agree. to make sure that there's a counter to the, uh, the pur only purpose of education is for you again, to get I a job. The, the and sometimes, though, yeah. we have to do that yeah. with our own students. Right, mm -hmm. I understand yeah. that, of course. Yeah. But sometimes, going back to the conflict that we're seeing today is that the people that control the purse strings, or the state in this case, does no longer see education as a, as a public good. This is part of our problem, nor does much of management yes. in, in the educational institutions. So the problem is, is they're not on the same page, you know, at all. And that, you know, we're, we're in the position of having to, you know, not only struggle, but also to educate, and how long does this process go on? I mean, when, you know, it's, it's much like climate change, you can tell, you know, everybody that the planet's going to go, you know, in the next 20 years, but, you know, the oil companies are not going to change, right? <laughs> the banking community is not going to change. The profit motive involved in, you know, fossil fuels does not change. So again, uh, the, you know, uh, where, where, does, where does the struggle really happen, um, you know, at these levels besides just the rhetorical? And there the, doesn't the seem to be any, any challenge to the mainstream position, right. whether it's Barack Obama or right, right. the Tea Party people or whatever yeah. the case may be, that the function of universities is about economic well-being, that it's good for, good for the economic well-being of the community, it's good for the economic future of, of students rather than education itself or universities as a value onto themselves that goes beyond or is different. You cannot be reduced to economic values. Right. And you see the new rankings about schools are not really about what you learn, but how much you're going to earn. Yeah. <laughs> this is how the new quantitative approach is, is engaged. It used to be, can you get a well-rounded, where you come out of, a, you know, a, a more holistic or a whole person. Today, it's all about, you know, you'll earn X amount of dollars. You know, and we see this going on at LIU. The new mantra is is about the economic value of of, of of the of the college education, not exactly what you learn. In fact, our whole website now is filled with corporate logos, which should be a fight, in my opinion, in terms of the you know, yeah. of the of, of the faculty senate and other things, because these symbols again have an unconscious effect on a lot of our students and our faculty, who you know. A lot are unconscious too about these things, so so um, yeah. I mean, we're not. I, I'm not trying to be overly pessimistic here, but I think we have to b take into account the real aspects of what we're fighting, you know, and understand, mm -hmm. you know, the depth of the battle and that it's been going on so long. This increasing, you know, for lack of a better term, right. privatization and corporatization of the educational thing, and to bring back into public discourse, as Sharon mentioned, right. the idea of education as a public good or an education for citizenship, as Dewey, you know, had talked about. How do we be, begin to become educators again? You know, because mm -hmm. I think we've lost our function in that. And, you know, this, this, this raises other, of course, questions around, you know, what has what the faculty been doing during this period of time? Except, you know, yes, criticizing and maybe trying to struggle a little bit with placards on the streets, but where, where is the, the real fight and the real you know, um, right. engagement, yeah. 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 yeah, well, I mean, yeah. I understand what you're saying, yeah. and yeah. Uh, yes, these are real challenges. Um, I, you know, I agree that it's, you know, education serves a very important social function. I think you articulated that extremely well, and, um, and I, you know, and I think that, it, you know, we will persevere, that um, educators, you know, are a very important value, 
part of society and having an education. People need to know how to read and write and speak and, and, and to be educated to participate in civil society. So these are things that, you know, are, we hold dear to our hearts. And, uh, and um, yes, there are other forces that are very strong. I, I understand that, but um, I'm not ready to just say that, you know, this is, you know, a lost cause. You know, I don't believe that the liberal arts is over and done with. You know, I don't believe that uh, reading and writing and thinking and learning how to uh, and being educated and participating in, in the life of, uh, of the mind is something that's over and done with, you know. And I don't think that corporate types are doing a good job, number one, of running universities, you know. So I, things can change. You know, and yes, they could change for the worse, I agree, but they can also change for the better. And, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of play. There's a lot of play, um, you know, in the next year and, and in the next decades that, you know, things are going to shake out. But uh, I don't think that the educational, the life of the mind is, is something that, you know, I'm ready to throw in the towel. So in this case, should um, the educators take control of the universities? Should we occupy the universities to put it back in the hands and take the risk that way? Should we really just say it's time to take power in a, in a way? I mean, I'm, I'm throwing that out as an right. abstraction, but also as something because that we need to discuss. Because if what you say is true, yeah. then the yeah. people who run yeah. the universities right. should be guided by different values, values. than right. the ones right. that are dominant today. I think both I you agree. and Sharon are implying that. Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. I do agree. I, I believe that in order to be really uh, good at, you know, running a university, I think administrators need to understand and value education 100%. And, you know, it, that is something, you know, it, it's like if you want somebody to do a good job, then they need to understand what the job is, you know, and if they, and, and so a, a corporate model is not necessarily going to be successful in terms of how to make an educate you know an educational institution vital and strong um, so I, I would agree with you that we need to see you know different people right. you know see our, our, our good friend uh, Stanley Aronowitz has made a, I think a crucial distinction between education and schooling that we have is schooling today we have training we, rep we, we, we build people to reproduce the system as it is. We don't really build, in general, critical thinking. And this is also part of the faculty responsible in this because, you know, a lot of the faculty is not really trained in educating anymore or in, in, in uh, critical thinking, et cetera. So the, the, the question for the unions is, do the unions have to take a kind of high ground on this, you know, and really become more and more of, you know, a if you will, an avant-garde of an educational um, a moment, right? Yeah. How, how would this, you know, move in, say, a PSC, which has a lot of brain power, nothing but researchers and stuff, but still no contract, right? And, still no yeah, contract. Yes, right. And, and, yeah, you yeah, know, we have yeah, been yeah, involved yeah. in resisting some of those moves. The, okay. the, um, I wouldn't say the resistance was always successful, right. but... Um, We've mounted a resistance to the supposed stream, the streamlining of our curriculum that mm -hmm. was called the Pathways Project, right, which, sure. uh, mm -hmm. which the PSC did resist. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I think we have a role there, and we'll continue to play it. Um, I'm not sure that we're the only role. I mean, there's the faculty are organized in other ways that that the PSC represents the faculty as workers, but the faculty as as faculty, as as educators, are represented by their own faculty governance, and so I think there's a right. there's a faculty governance role here too that we. So have you're can't. separating the function well, of the Senate from the union. They are functionally to a degree, they are functionally governance. separate. Currently, yeah, functionally separate yeah. organizations no. that have different responsibilities. Personally, and I, I think, think that was devised well, by the by the you know management in some ways no, to have it, that separation. But again, I'm, that could be it off. Can have a historical <laughs> right, uh, right. you know origins that. Mm -hmm. um, no, but in, in right. any case, it's the structure that we do have now. Right. And so, yeah. and in many I cases, universities do not have unions, but they do have yes. faculty yes. governance and faculty right. senates. That's true. 
Yeah. Um, I guess what we're trying, I mean, what I'm trying to go to, towards is that, you know, maybe unions, and, you know, we see this tendency in the United States, almost in all unions, that it's only about wages and benefits. Yeah. It's not really about ideas mm. and, and, you well, know. To respond to your point, yeah, which I think yeah, is a sure. very good yeah, one, yeah. I think this really relates to a uh, perspective that you mentioned perhaps in your introduction, mm -hmm. which has to do with, you know, is it collective bargaining or is it collective begging? Right. And the reason I see a connection here, which by the way, I agree with you mm -hmm. and your idea about uh, cent uh, faculty governance and unions being uh, separated as mm -hmm. weakened us, mm -hmm. but I think the issue that I see is that um, to the extent that unions in the university and, and, and outside the university as well, as well, that they focus very narrowly on bargaining, 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 which is important, I get it, you know, wages, insurance, policies, this, that, and so on and so forth. Be, in that narrow focus, we've lost a lot of the principles that inform us and make us strong. So I think some of the principles that inform us and make us strong are really more in the collective part of collective bargaining. And I say that to say that it is a collective action, number one, of worker empowerment. But in addition to that, I think that, you know, what, what does worker empowerment mean? Worker empowerment is that you have control over your production. So if you're in a bakery, you have control over, you know, how that loaf of bread gets made and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. Well, we happen to be workers in higher education. So therefore, for us, worker empowerment is really about being in control of what it means to have an education and what it means to have a university. So I would say that 100%, we need to be unions in higher education, need to be involved in defining, you know, the principles that have inform us. Wages and benefits are important, agreed. The bargaining is important, but there are larger principles at stake here. There are way larger principles at stake, and those larger principles have to do with collective uh, struggle, in my opinion. But uh, beyond collective struggle, it's the principles of what is an education, because that's mm -hmm. our business. You know, so... Um, yeah, I mean, the interesting thing to me, I don't think anybody goes into teaching initially for the money, right? They go in because they want to make a difference or they really want to... Well, maybe, maybe they do. I mean, I'm not so sure about that, that people actually go into teaching for the money. Yeah, you know, There's we, nothing wrong with well, it. It's it it no it's 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 yeah. it's just for the money. Like we no, said. just for the money. No. I'm just saying. You know, listen, I'm a social worker by training, no, no, so you got to understand that making a lot of money yeah. wasn't like my... But, um, no, no, of course. But, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm just saying that, you know, yeah, but it's been reduced right. to wages, benefits, and all the conversations are always about, you know. Right. Yeah. But those aren't the, the only... As I said, the PSC did wage a struggle against the curricular changes called Pathways. Right, right, um, and right. we do have, even in mm. the contract enforcement, enforcement area, there's the local governance plan that sort of functions as part of a contract. So, so we do have some role in, in, in trying to see that the colleges abide by the other things that they've mm -hmm. said that they will abide mm -hmm. by. Mm -hmm. um, I, I also think that we, we don't leave our academic disciplines you know, behind us when we come and start doing more and more union work. I mean, it, it, it uh, um, certainly informs the discussions we have. It, it's, these are the things that, one of the things at least that people will get passionate about, that they don't like the, the administrator looking over their shoulder in their classroom, which, which is happening right. more and more. So yeah. I, it's, I think it's there in it just has to be, I agree with you, it has to just be, you know, we have to build on it. We have to be, have the ability to identify when we see it. You know, for just as an example, perhaps, you know, for example, being told, you know, what textbook you can use or, you know, administrators in some places are trying to exert control, not just over the, you know, even more narrowly, even more intrusively trying to determine the curriculum, trying to determine the textbook. I mean, we have to begin to frame these. This is our, you know, purview. This is our purview, not for some administrator to come along and say, you know, you're teaching this section of this and that, so you have to do this, you know, because that's not the nature of our work. So 
I mean, I think that it is the job of the leadership, which is, I think, what you're saying, to identify the places where we can bring education and bring it, you know, into our our purview and our province because it it 100% is. It can't just be about wages and benefits and so on and so forth. It's it it, it is not sustaining. It is not sustaining. Charlie, let me let me ask you a question of, about the difficulties of organizing academics, because what, <laughs> because you know academics are not necessarily so the easiest. Oh, that yeah, it, it can be very difficult, obviously. But one of the difficulties is, unlike factory workers, for example, academics work in isolation most of the time. We teach in the classroom as individuals, not in teams or in groups. Obviously, most of the research we do on our own sitting at home or in a library or out in the field somewhere. On the beach. Just <laughs> on the beach. I'm joking. And that's only Peter during I know. the summer. Yes, right. the, that's only <laughs> the summer. But what, one of the, uh, uh, and of course, as we probably will all agree, uh, we have potential power only when we are unified, only as a collective. Exactly. And yet, many times, the tactics of our organizing is. I've been in union meetings where emotions are running high and people are ready to act. And the directions are go home and send in a postcard mm. to Albany expressing your displeasure right. or sign a petition, which seems to further individualize us. What, what can academics even do to bring academics together mm. as a whole, as a group, rather than reinforcing this individualized existence that that we have much of the time? Well, you know, we do some of those things. Um, I would say that there, there are a lot of opportunities within the union structure to work on union issues with the people you work with. And um, one of the things that, at least in the underfunded community colleges in the city university that we've almost all worked on is, is projects having to do with a abysmal condition of the buildings and grounds. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that you know, some of what has to be done is to organize people where they are working. Mm -hmm. that's, that's one of the, one of the uh, real ways, I think, to do them about the issues that concern them on a day-to-day -day kind of basis. So for us, it has been yeah. you know, the, the chronic underfunding that leads to uh, in, inadequate maintenance, that leads to buildings falling down, that leads to unsafe working conditions. And so it does become, it's one of those um, things we bargain around, uh, you know, terms and conditions of employment, the, the work conditions in which we work. Um, and that's going to bring us together as it, it has as a collective. You know, it's not the only thing, but body. it has. It, but it's one of the things that that I've seen how people have some success on 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 various campuses. I I, I mean, I think that that um, you know, the PSC is a, a and CUNY is a big uh, outfit, <laughs> um, and we are. As you said, there, there are lots of us, and we are further kind of collected into individual campuses. Right. So some of the things that have to be done is, is better organizing on campuses around campus-specific things. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm sure, uh, clearly, at CUNY, you have very different challenges because you're so much bigger, and you have all, all these multi-campuses. You know, we have you know, the, we're the Brooklyn campus, but um, I understand what you're saying is, you know, we've talked about this in our union meetings as well, is you have to find issues. Number one, you have to be able to identify and define issues that resonate with people. Um, and I think that oftentimes things like facilities and deterioration of the, you know, physical plan and so on, the fact that you go to work and it's cold and then you, you know, these are things that people do care about. So I, I think that those are important issues. Um, I think that leadership, it, labor unions have had a problem in terms of leadership style, you know, because uh, I think that leadership style has been, um, is, is antiquated, I think it's been um, hierarchical and top down way too often, and so I am completely against, you know, hierarchical, top down 
union structures that I consider antiquated and actually patriarchal in their formation. But in any event, I think that one of the reasons that apathy exists in, is because when you have people who are leaders and they feel like they can make all the decisions by themselves, you know, with one person or two people or three people, then you're going to have dis you know you're going to have a disengaged membership. Our you know, our goal in the LIUFF is to open up the part, you know, I believe in participant or, you know, organizational style. So I think that, you know, it's that when you do that, it, it engages people. So I think that's why the Occupy movement, for example, was successful, you know, and did resonate, you know, bec because it was not part of this antiquated leadership style. So I think unions... But you are the president of a union, correct? I'm a president. <laughs> yes. But, elect but with an anarchist heart, I'll tell you right now, <laughs> anarchist heart, and, and uh, I, I believe in different kinds of, you know, leadership that is open, that is part, that is inclusive, that brings people in. You know, I'm not interested in being like the decision maker, smartest person in the room kind of style because that's how, that's what leads to people, you know, having a disengaged membership. I believe in the collective, the strength of the collective. Good. Um, would you like to add to this a little bit? We're, we're beginning to run I'm, out of time. No, I think uh, that I think close. I'll just leave it with yeah, Jessica. You don't I think see that, a, that it a is a greater role for the well, contingent labor it's, it's, and, um, at the PSC since you're, you know, basically most of your officers are, um, you know, full timers. So uh, yeah. w we do have representation okay. on our executive council, and that's the, the that's place good. where the major policy decisions get made. Okay, so. great. Okay. Well, thank you very, very much. This was a very stimulating, engaging conversation. We hope to have another one as we get closer to hopefully a successful resolution of the PSC contract with the state and city of New York. And, of course, LIUFF is going to negotiations in about another two weeks, and we'll be sitting at the table, and our contract expires in August. So we'll welcome both of you back uh, in the near future to discuss progress and, you know, union struggle. And hopefully today we can say we'll hopefully put education back in the hands of the public good and in the hands of the people that actually do the educating. Here, so here. thank you very, very much. And this is Michael Pelius with Peter Bratzis for the show The Radical Imagination. We'll see you soon and thank you for uh, viewing tonight.